7.33 p.m. And first item on our agenda is the approval of minutes. I will make a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting that was held on November 19th, 2016. I have a second. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, any any comments or any discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on November twenty first, two thousand and sixteen. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Good. Okay. Number three: questions and comments. Audience comments are always welcome as agenda items are discussed. The school committee has set aside 15 minutes on this agenda to enable members of the audience to raise questions and make comments on any matter of general concern that is not on the agenda. Individual speakers uh, shall be limited to three minutes and speakers are reminded that the meeting is being televised and are asked to respect the privacy rights of others. Comments against any individual are not allowed by policy 3.7.5. Anybody have any comments? We have a big crowd tonight, which is wonderful. Okay, we'll move on to number four, superintendent's report and good news. Thank you. I do want to mention the VFW essay contest ceremony that was held on Saturday morning. This is an annual thing and reflects two essay contests. One um, is a Patriot's Pen uh, competition and the other is a Voice of Democracy competition. One at the uh, middle school level and one the second one at the high school level. Uh, there were nine uh, honorees uh, for that uh, event. and. Um, Three of them were from St. Paul's, which is typically the case, and uh, the others uh, re represented our middle school and high school students. The great thing was, in addition to the fact that there were uh, three award winners in each contest in each category, more than, and this is a, a unbelievable number, uh, there were more than 400 students this year in those two uh, grade categories um, who wrote essays. So these nine were truly the best of the best. I'm always disappointed that they don't read those essays at the, at the time, but they ultimately do get printed typically in the journal and we'll be able to read them over time. But that's just an outstanding um, level of, um, of, of competitiveness and outstanding level of participation uh, in the past. It, just smaller numbers of individual students uh, have participated, but because of the, the leadership of Laney Silva uh, and also particularly at the middle school, uh, Heather uh, Sullivan, uh, we encourage more and more kids to participate. So it was a wonderful event. Actually, Ted Alexiadis uh, was the speaker for the day. There's always someone who's the uh, keynote speaker, and, uh, and he was chosen, actually, I think for the second year in a row because as a high school student, he participated in that uh, competition in another state. So, uh, so he spoke. The students re uh, earned bonds and and a, a medal, a kind of recognition. They were presented individually. Photos were taken. Good refreshments were had, and it's, it's just a special time for all. So, I really appreciated that. Second thing I want to mention is that in your packet there is a a letter that recognizes Kim Smith, who's our Food Services Director for um, her attainment of Level 2 certification uh, in school nutrition. And this is, um, of course, based upon the USDA standards uh, that have to be met in, by our school nutrition uh, programs. And the uh, School Nutrition Association of Massachusetts uh, is the authorizing agency to uh, provide the training and award this. So uh, congratulations to Kim for, for that achievement. I also want to mention to you that um, if you have a chance to check out the school committee uh, website, we have uh, updated it with uh, your emails, your school emails, which are fairly recent that you all have a hinghamschools.org um, email, and so those are there, uh, referenced there uh, as is um, a, uh, a statement about um, the ways that we would uh, handle uh, communications, particularly communications that are not signed. So 
So that's an update and just to point out that it is there and actually prompted by the fact that uh, we it was reported to us that uh, there wasn't an easy way to to reach school committee members. There are ways, um, but to reach them quickly and have uh, individual emails was something that was new so it's there and it's done and I think Cynthia will have a comment when she does her community outreach about another step that we need to uh, uh, take in that regard communications received by the superintendent uh, I want to mention the uh, very special day that's coming up on Wednesday <laughs> where the town is celebrating uh, and at, at the uh, with the leadership of Keith German who is the um, Veterans Services uh, Administrator national and this is a national recognition 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor so Remembrance Day activities at the Hingham shipyard US Navy amphibious veterans of Massachusetts Memorial which is a new memorial of course that's there and I do have flyers if anyone in the audience would be interested in those details they're pretty prominently publicized but uh, the activity will be at 1 55 uh, p.m. at Hingham shipyard Wednesday uh, December 7th open to the public and public are certainly encouraged to come members of the military with federal state and local officials will be in attendance and a wreath will be placed uh, at the US Naval amphibious veterans of Massachusetts Memorial that is there a fairly recent memorial so uh, everyone welcome and encouraged to attend and there are flies on the table at the end if you'd like to get it in writing I'll try to attend um, 5.2 student communications Brad Patterson will report Um, hello for those of you who don't know me my name is Brad Patterson and I'm a senior at Hingham High School so uh, on the sports front not too much this week due to the fact that it's in the middle of the two seasons a lot of teams are still going through um, tryouts but the first track meet will be this Thursday at Reggie Lewis and going into news for this week other than sports we have tomorrow after school Dr. Jordan McCann will be, hold, will be meeting with students immediately after school for the student principal forum in the main office uh, Wednesday, as Dr. Murkan said, there will be a memorial um, for Pearl Harbor, and the uh, Students Club, the Veterans Appreciation Club, will be in attendance at the memorial. Also, this Wednesday will be a delayed start, and will also be the first day of uh, debate for the debate team at Old Rochester High School. The following Thursday, will, as I said, will be the track meet, um, and tomorrow in the gym before school, there will be a group photo with a second year cancer patient in his second round of treatment. And the goal is to have at least 100 students attend and participate and potentially donate. And all funds raised will be uh, donated directly to the Dana Farber Association. And Quiz Bowl, uh, since the creation of the Quiz Bowl team more than eight years ago, they have made it to the television show every year, and which will be happening in January. Currently, there are two fundraisers at the high school. First, the gymnastics team is having a fundraiser through Savers, and second, Stuco is currently doing a fundraiser for children's toys. And the 13th of December, uh, there will be a band concert at Hingham High School at 7 o'clock. Any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, then 5.3, other communications. Um, the Hingham High School newsletter, which is uh, in your packet, has some, uh, I think, particularly interesting things in it this time, and I wanted to call your attention, if you hadn't had a chance to read it yet, to read about the uh, planned Tenoji trip um, coming to Hingham again um, in uh, March of this coming year. Uh, and that's, I think, something that both students and faculty and community members are looking forward to. Um, in addition, there is an article there about um, social study teachers Chrissy O'Connor's uh, participation uh, in the Understanding Sacrifice program. And uh, this particular uh, article in the newsletter uh, talks about the lessons that she has created as a uh, uh, participate in that program over uh, two years and um, also that these are going to be memorialized permanently on a website so accessible not just to Hingham uh, faculty and, and, and people who know Chrissy but to people throughout the country. It's a wonderful program, quite an honor that she was selected uh, two years in a row and um, we're very proud of her. Can I just follow up on that? Mm -hmm. um, Chrissy actually ran a 
day long workshop um, in DC this past Friday mm -hmm. for the National Council for Social Studies at right. the American Battle Monuments Commission offices. So she gave a, a full day mm -hmm. presentation. So just want to, you know, right. kudos yeah. to her. That's yeah. quite impressive. Yeah. And that organization is one of the co-sponsors of the Understanding Sacrifice Correct. Program, the other co-sponsor being uh, National History Day. Mm -hmm. so. Great. National activities by our teachers. That's what we like. Um, okay. New business. Um, 6.1 on our agenda, we had to hear a pre-budget financial forecast from Town Administrator Ted Alexiades, but unfortunately he notified us this morning that he wouldn't be able to join us. And um, the handouts are with Ted, so uh, <laughs> we will um, we will reschedule for him as soon as possible. But the forecast is looking better than the last one that we saw on November 19th. So um, that's always good news. So we will move on to 6.2, and we have several items from our high school team today. So. Um, so 6.2, to hear a report from Hingham High School, including the school council improvement plan update from 2015-2016 school year and the proposed plan for 2016-2017. And our high school principal, Paula, Dr. Paula Gerard McCann, is going to present. Great, and thank you. Perhaps we could ask Alec. You're the nearest person who's expert <laughs> to manage the whites. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, can, oh, there we go. I know I am now sixth and final school improvement plan, but the high school is different. There is only one high school. And one thing that is unique about the school council at the high school is that we actually have students on our council. We have several members of the council with us here tonight, Brad being one of them. Also, I think what's unique, unique about us is, you know, one of you was always assigned as a school community liaison, K as ours this year, but actually two of the members were former school community members, Ray Estes and Barbara Cook, who have just stayed with us over the years, so we welcome their input. School council, um, to the school council I share my budget proposals, we worked on the strategic plan that I know you have approved, we review the handbook every year, and of course we get green updates always from uh, Rick Swanson who's our green czar. We meet the first Monday of every month at 5 p.m. That's a good time for the students because they're coming usually after practice of some sort. At our next meeting, one of two of the things we'll be doing is looking at the new program of studies, uh, the changes to the program of studies, and we'll also be talking about the memorandum of agreement that has been approved, I gather, between the school and the police. Not yet approved. Oh, okay, yeah, under discussion, not. sorry. So I'll be sharing that with them as well. So, the, so this, those are some of the things that we do, but of course, coming up with the school improvement plan is one of our key roles. And our goals from last year are posted up there. The first one, review and expand the health curriculum. As you remember, the next slide is from last year when I explained why we can flip to the next slide. From. We changed the graduation requirements. You approved that. You remember we dropped the computer course. It's really kind of outdated now. And we went for a full semester course in health because there's so many issues in the socio-emotional world are coming up, and we need a place for them, and that is our health class. So some of the changes on the next slide that you will see, Karen Beatty, our health coordinator, our health resource teacher, has been working on this. The change will be that one full semester, so she'll get to see them for 75 classes straight. We plan to put this in the sophomore year since they are mature enough to handle it then. Freshman is a little too soon. If we have to be flexible with scheduling, we'll work on that. But the focus will be for the sophomore year. She's expanding some topics, as you can see, mental health, growing problems, stress. We talk about that all the time. First aid, she does CPR, things like that. She will expand that even more. Sex education, relationships, personal safety, and so on. The new topics, you can't pick up the paper without reading something about the opioid epidemic, so she'll be talking about addiction, not just to opioids, but to other things. Technology and health. How does technology affect health? What we do with technology, as well as how we use it. And then she's going to look at some long-term issues. Healthcare proxy, who would think to bring that up in high school? But it's a term the kids should be familiar with. As well as health insurance, family risk factors, things like that. She never had time to get to any of those topics before. But with the extended class, she will now be able to do that. So that's something she's worked on. She's piloting a few units this year. But hopefully it will go into place next year when we change our graduation requirements. So that's all set. NASC, you'll see, is a goal last year and again this year. 
they are the team, you know, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges accredits high schools every 10 years, and a team of educators comes and spends Sunday through Wednesday at the high school talking to virtually a representative of every constituency, parents, school committee, superintendent, every faculty member, the students, they actually spend a day shadowing students. Part of that to prepare them is we send them a self-study in advance, and it's quite, quite an undertaking. We began it last year. We identified the chair, Jennifer Hendrickson, the assistant principal, has volunteered <coughs> to take on that huge task. She's chairing that. We have formed a steering committee. We, there are seven standards on which we will be evaluated. We have a chair in place for each of those standards committees. Every member of the faculty has been assigned to a committee. We have non-faculty members also, students, parents on some other committees, as well as support personnel. Last year, we used our pro professional development time to begin the process. And you'll see this year, it is a main focus for us. And we will be continuing along those lines. The third goal, we talked a lot about stress. And we found that one of the big stressors for students is homework. And that was a chart you might remember from last year. And you can see how much time the average student spends on homework. So to address that, we decided to look at uh, homework and look for different ways to come up with homework assignments. So our goal was the next slide, please, Dr. Kellum, uh, was to come up with alternative assignments or more creative assignments. So teachers worked in their departments during our release time, and we also spent a lot of faculty meeting time on this topic. The flipped classroom, I, I defined it there just in case people weren't familiar with that. It's basically the idea you flip the learning. Instead of me showing you a video in class and we talking about it, I might give you the video to watch for homework. As an English teacher, I might assign you watch Act 1 of Othello, and then we'll discuss it the next day in class. We don't use our class time for that. A lot of the assignments were related to that, flipping things around, having students watch videos. And then I gave you a couple of samples in your plan, but one I thought was particularly interesting was the idea of having choice. These were different options you could have. This was one homework assignment, but maybe you'd like to, there was a vocabulary list there, define it and use it. Maybe you, the, the green, obviously, are hyperlinks, and you could click to a template to fill out to take your notes. You could use a study guide. You could do a lot of different things. And the last one, you could take a reading quiz. If you would rather do that, you could do that. So we, the idea was to play into things that would interest students. So topics like this, as well as many, many apps, was shared with the faculty. We hope people are noticing there are different homework assignments. And as you know, environmental sustainability has always been a focus. We have a very active green team. I'm sure Brad told you about America Recycles Day, one of our national holidays at Hingham High School. The whole day was an environmental teach-in. But the green team researched changes that we could suggest. And we'll be passing these along to Mr. Ferris, and we hope some of them might be able to be implemented. We started with the simple ones, changing the light bulbs, improving the insulation, looking at the solar panels we used to have that are floating around. And the last one is certainly the most interesting, but certainly the most extensive. Actually, we actually got information about making a, a solar canopy in the far parking lot. It would be quite extensive, but we're happy to share all those details with you, John, in your spare time. And then uh, our final goal last year was to reduce our waste by 10%. And I'm very pleased to say we, in fact, exceeded that goal. We used to have three dumpsters. The third dumpster, which was picked up, picked up a few times a week, and there was a cost to that, it's now been replaced by a single-stream recycling dumpster. So we are really quite proud. E even today, when I was leaving, the custodian came in to empty one, my waste basket. There was one Kleenex in it. That was it. I can tell you, five years ago, there wasn't a lot in there. So really, the efforts for recycling and composting have been terrific, and they have paid off very much so. So that was last year. This year, we again have five goals. The first one is to examine our practice of calculating and reporting GPAs. I'm happy to say we have finished that, and you'll be hearing a detailed report later from um, Heather Rodriguez and me, and there are also members of the committee who worked with us. With us. The second one, fostering a school climate. I brought came in the summer and talked a lot about those initi initiatives, but if you would flip to the next slide, Dr. Gallo. Uh, some of the things that we have done already, we had Dana, Deb and Dana Hult from Core Training come in and work on two days with approximately 100 senior leaders, 50 one day, 50 the other. It was terrific, and when budget time comes around, you'll see a proposal from me to include that as a regular, it's $3,000, to include that as a regular thing every year. It really would. The, feedback we got from the kids was terrific. Something else we have already done is bring in Katie Cappiello. Uh, she's an, uh, actually a Brockton native, 
but she is now very well established in New York City. She's an artistic director, and she's the author of the play Slut, which is about slut shaming in a high school. And she came and she worked with the whole sophomore class, and I have to say she was very well received. A group of students have on their own formed a club they've called Peers. They've been meeting regularly. It's very student-driven. Heather goes to the meetings more just have an adult in the room, but they have come up with a list of activities, and they met with me one day last week, quite an ambitious undertaking. So we talked about what they could do. They wanted parent workshops and student workshops and, and movie nights. It was wonderful to see the ideas that they had. So they're going to start to build on that, and that was all student-driven. I'm also very happy to say that thanks to a grant from the Hingham High PTO, we're able to bring Katie back. So she's going to be back in April, and she'll work with the cast members of the play. We are the first high school to do the play ourselves. To bring her group in, you might remember I said $35,000 for her troupe to come and perform. We're not doing that. Instead, we, our drama club, will produce the play. No high school has done that before. So she's really has a vested interest in our success. So she's going to come back and work with the cast, and she'll also check back in with the sophomores to see the plans that they have. So that's underway. Coming up in the winter, <coughs> oh, not yet. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you may know all the sophomore girls get rad training, rape, aggression, defense training. I took it myself. It's excellent, but it's only for the girls. So often we'll get the complaints, why are the boys playing ping pong while the girls are getting this training? What are you going to do for the boys? So we've met with Dove, and they're going to come in and provide workshops specifically geared for sophomore boys, and those will run concurrently while the girls are getting their rape, aggression, aggression, aggression defense training. The Dove people have come in and met with Meg Melanson and Karen Beatty to make that plan. That will probably be in February. Then the last, oh, this full day community service, I'll talk about it in a minute, and of course, as I said, the play slut will be performed, and, they will be, and we will be very clear in our advertising that there's mature content, although I think it's wonderful for high school students, parents can make that decision. We never do the spring play during the school day because we are so knee deep into testing in May, we can't give up class time. It's always been an evening performance, so we will continue to do that in May. And there'll be a, like a talk back session afterwards. We're still working deciding who shall we invite. The cast members will be there, perhaps a rape counselor. We'd love to have Katie come back. We're hoping she might like to come just because we're the first high school to do that. We'll see about that. And we'll look for other people, maybe some, someone from a college campus. That's still under discussion. The, the Climate Committee is another group, uh, Ben Lockheim, one of the history teachers, has been sharing that. And we meet Tuesday morning, every other Tuesday morning at 7.15. It's open to we have several parent members. Anybody else who would like to join us is more than welcome. And two specific initiatives that they have undertaken. One is the idea of students supporting students. Students going not only to their own activities, but also to somebody else's. So they've created this Google spreadsheet. And the idea is if I'm in the drama club, I would sign up to go to the field talking game. If I'm on the field talking team, I might sign up to go to the band concert coming up next week or to go into the quiz bowl. So there would be greater support and greater awareness of what other kids do in their various clubs. So they have a whole web page going. It's really quite impressive. And Ben made a presentation at the, I don't know if any of you were at the Winter Sports meeting last week, but he made a presentation about that. And the second one, which again is a massive undertaking, undertaking we are going to have a senior community service day that we hope will involve virtually every senior in the senior class. Many, many have signed up already, and we're hoping that the enthusiasm will be infectious so that everybody will sign up. It will be on April 13th, and we're in the process right now of soliciting people, companies, institutions, organizations that might want some assistance that particular day. We sent out several letters at our last meeting. If you have any ideas, anybody here, or know of an organization that we might not have thought of, we would love to hear about it. We will send out teams of seniors to work at these various websites, uh, I mean, various places. It could be cleaning up the harbor, painting something at Foster School, a myriad of different possibilities. And we do need a lot of parent volunteers to help us out with that, too. So we'll be soliciting those as well. So if you'd like to help out physically, we would love to have you. Or if you have an idea for an organization, please do let me know, and I can pass it along to the Climate Committee. So those are two initiatives that, that are already in progress. Two more goals that uh, one is to create a cohesive plan of support for students struggling. This would be outside the special education realm. 
someone who might not have a serious learning disability, but should just need some short-term instruction in executive functioning, that seems to be our biggest problem. So we have a pilot we're working on, I'll tell you more about that this time next year. And finally, the last one, again, getting back to our green ribbon and sustainability issue, we want to get involved in this big climate change summit that's coming up in Boston this year. We don't have all the details, but we will be working on that, and I hopefully will have loads of pictures about that at this time next year. So that's what's been going on and what we plan to do each year. Uh, does anybody have questions? Comments? Yes. Just a question kind of <coughs> backing off of what Brad said. When you have the monthly meetings with the students, I'm just curious. Which monthly meetings? Uh, I'm sorry, for the students to oh, come Oh, those are quarterly. Quarterly, quarterly okay. student okay. forums, quarterly. yes, those are quarterly. I'm just curious as to how many students... Um, Carol, I wish I could tell you you couldn't move, the room was so full, but that would be a lie. <laughs> they, are, they are not well attended. I They're wish not. more kids would come. So what, I wonder what we could do to facilitate that, because knowing high school kids, they mm -hmm. have lots of ideas and complaints, and yes, they, yep. it would be an awesome opportunity it for them be. to come forward yeah. to share. I do get a lot through organizations and through advisors, so I think sometimes kids funnel it that way. And, and I'm amazed at how many kids will email me. I think email has taken away the, the nervousness about actually walking into an office and facing someone. I will get emails pretty regularly from students asking me questions or giving are often looking to start a new club or to come up with a new proposal or app. So and I they sort of break the ice, do they then come forward? I mean it's a great no, Well skill. usually what I do is say, Oh great, come on down and see me. So that gets them into okay. my office, but it's a one on one conversation between the two of us. Okay. Thank you. If you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. I just want to say that I'm pleased, uh, you know, uh, with the changes and the climate. The climate uh, there was a lot of uh, positivity I hear. As a matter of fact, I believe Justin uh, Whitney, he wrote, wrote a nice article in the Hingham Journal. Oh, yeah, yes, uh, I did, yeah. So did I pronounce his name yes, correct? Yes, Justin Whitney, you're absolutely correct. Uh, so uh, I thank you for that. Sure. That's exactly what we need here. I think those articles are great. Glenda, Glenda Garland, one of our school librarians, is responsible for those, and she's done a nice job of picking different grade levels and different students, focusing on the different things that go on in school. That's been a wonderful resource for us. Keep up with the job. Anybody else? Um, I had a question. Yes. Um, actually, I have a question for Brad, since he's here. <laughs> the homework choice, did you experience that from a teacher? You can use that. Microphone um, within this year, yeah, or uh, do particularly, mm -hmm. yeah. But I do like the idea of homework choice within our um, psychology class, especially recently. We've been looking at stressors within the within high schools. We watched the movie Race to Nowhere, mm -hmm. and one of the biggest things was definitely homework. And I think it's great that we are looking into that problem at the high school and trying to make it easier for students to complete a homework assignment or having it a possible way to reduce stress. So. Maybe I haven't seen this year, but yeah, just hearing it, that we're changing it is something great. Great, thank you. And um, just for the audience, we did get a lot more detail than, this was a PowerPoint bulleted presentation, but we had a lot more detail behind it and sounds like you had good plans going and I'm particularly happy that first goal was already achieved and <laughs> we're gonna hear about that tonight. Wow. So that's great. Um, so anyone else? Um, okay. So um, thank, thank you, you for thank those you. overarching goals of the regular day goes on, but these are just some specific things that they're tackling. Um, so the next item on our agenda, 6.3, to hear the annual placement and testing report for the class of 2016. And Heather Rodriguez, who is our director of counseling, is going to give that report. Yes, good evening everybody. Um, so this testing report, just I would like to introduce it as a snapshot of the college placement and testing taken by the students in the class of 2016. So clearly individuals in a class are much more than just their test scores, we all know that. However, average test scores across multiple content areas can give us a little bit of information about the group as a whole, so that's why we do this. Um, so this first slide is the future plans of the graduates. So this slide is a summary of the plans of the class upon graduation. So we see about 96% of them plan to continue their formal education, which is phenomenal. 3% um, 
I know it's a it's a <laughs> tiny little chart. <laughs> so maybe we'll cut off some ears next year and just do a clear some. Mm -hmm. Actually, go back again. I think if you click on the plus sign, I, I, I can't so zoom out. There we go. Click on plus. All right. So um, about 3% are going either directly to employment, um, and then about 1% are taking a year to either do a gap year program or pursue something else, or their plans weren't quite defined at the time that they graduated. The next slide will show the SAT. So the SAT. Basically, um, there was a lot of publicity about the SAT changing. That was not the case for last year's senior class. That is the case for this year's senior class. So next year, I will tell you all about the new format. But it was rolled out last March, which is after the applications process for last year's seniors. So they were not part of the new SAT. So you will get the heads up on that next year. Um, but basically, the SAT is three sections, critical reading, math, and writing. And there are, as you can see, the reading section, 67 questions in two 25-minute sections, and then another 20-minute section. Math, similar, 54 questions with two 25-minute sections, a 20-minute section as well. Um, and then a writing section would be on the next page, I believe. And then there is always the um, unscored section that they use to norm and test out new questions that they may use on future versions. So that's supposed to be a section that could be either another reading, another math, it varies depending on the test. All right, so this is just a graphic representation of the um, combined SAT reasoning score over time. Um, the SAT is scored on a scale of 200 to 800 for each section. The majority of colleges don't include the writing section in the admissions consideration. Um, they might use that later when they are placing students um, in certain classes. So typically a score is reported between four, 400 and 1600. So Hingham's mean score was 1131 for this class, which is down 22 points from the previous year. Um, but when you look longitudinally over the past couple of decades, there have been steady increases. Every once in a while there's a decrease, um, but generally we're right within the realm of where the students have performed lately. Um, so the drop this year follows gains from the past two years, which were higher than they had been. Um, so it'll be difficult to tell if the decrease is a trend or if it's just a blip in time. Um, but I don't know if we will ever know that because the SAT format is changing. <laughs> so that will kind of, we won't be comparing apples to apples anymore after this year. Um, so the mean for the class of 2016, I think it is good to mention that it is, you know, within the norm of what Hingham has done in the past several years. Reading section, um, the reading mean was 555. That's a 22 point drop. And again, we don't know any causes at this point, but we just noticed the difference. Um, the math mean was 569, so that was a more modest seven, put, seven point drop from last year. Sorry, I think our chart again is a little longer than the screen is. Um, so how do we know if we're go doing a good job on the SAT compared, we compare ourselves to some other schools. So Hingham High School has 19 other benchmark communities that are similar demographics, similar size, and similar to us in a number of variables. And so we use these communities to compare ourselves to them to see where we fall. Um, so our school scores for SATs are right in the center of the group. This is not, um, by score achievement, it is by alphabet. So <laughs> you will see us literally right in the middle of the graph. Um, but 10 schools in reading have higher scores than we do, but we're higher than eight. Um, we are tied with one in the reading category. Seven schools have a higher math mean, and we have a higher math mean than 12 of the schools. Writing, seven schools have a higher writing mean than we do, and we have a higher 
mean than 11 of our schools and we are tied with one in that area as well. So although our scores went down a bit, we're still right in the middle of the pack when we compare ourselves to those communities. So next we go on to subject tests. So whereas the SAT is a reasoning test and it covers the reading, the math, the writing, subject tests are shorter one hour content based tests. These tests are recommended or required by the most competitive colleges. Typically, typically a student will take um, subject tests in an area of their choice. They're generally not mandated by any school in a specific area unless of course a student's maybe going for engineering then it would behoove them to take maybe a math and a science or if they're going for nursing they would concentrate on science or if they want to be an accounting major math would be very important for them. Um, so it is usually a student's choice but it depends on what their future career goals are. Um, 72 students in the class of 2016 um, took subject tests at all. There were 271 students in the class. Um, so this first one is biology ecological. There are two biology exams. One is <coughs> ecological focus and one is a molecular focus. Um, our science curriculum doesn't really pair well with either of those exams. It used to back before MCAS, but now our curriculum is obviously allied with the state test. So the science department doesn't necessarily recommend taking this test, but if students are going to be interested in taking it, it's typically the freshmen who are in honors biology. They will take it upon completion of the course, and that's taken in ninth grade. Um, and because our curriculum isn't perfectly aligned with it, they do have to do a fair amount of independent study on their own. So there are SAT guidebooks put out by the college board, and so typically they, students will kind of get those and prepare in that way. Um, so this year, 31 students took that exam. The mean rose to 699, and um, that was pretty, pretty similar to last year where 39 kids took the exam. Um, the molecular focus test exists as well. That is a little more variable. We don't have a slide on that one because this year only three students took it, so you can't really report a meaningful mean score when you have that few students. Um, so we skipped that for this year. The next science test would be chemistry. Same thing, it is taken on upon completion of that course. Typically it's honors sophomore students. Um, the mean was 667 this year, which is a little bit lower, but it is kind of not really statistically significant and it's right in line with the past four years worth of data. 25 students sat for that exam and um, last year there were 20 students, so we saw a few more kids take that one. Moving on to English literature, the first of the humanities. The mean was 629. 19 students took that um, this year, last year 21 students took it, so there wasn't a big difference in the number of test takers, but the mean did drop for us. Um, the state mean stayed about the same, but you saw kind of a larger drop in the national mean as well, so I don't know if that means the test got a little harder for everyone except for the rest of Massachusetts. <laughs> 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 Not quite sure on that one. Um, and I, I haven't heard any specific feedback about the content on that test, so I don't know if it was seemed any different to the kids than any other year. Um, moving into math, there are two math subject tests. One is math level one, one is math level two. Math level one does not go as far into the curriculum content as math level two does. Math level two is a harder, more difficult exam. Um, so math one is the first option, so maybe some students who are going into the business field might take this one versus an engineering or to be a math major who would take math level two. Um, the mean rose this year to 662, up from 629, so that was a nice jump. 27 students took it this year, 28 took it last year, so we see consistency in that. And the state and national average, um, the state average stayed the same, the national average dropped. So that didn't have an impact on us for that exam. The math level two, we see really high performance on this pretty much every year. It's one of our highest means. So 701, 30 kids took it this year, 34 took it last year. So that's consistent as well. Um, and the state and national means are pretty consistent as from last year. Jumping back to science, physics would be taken usually by juniors. 
um, upon completion of that course in the honors level. 686 is right in line with where it has been in the past few years. Um, again, not a statistically significant change. 18 kids took it this year, 19 took it last year, so that's the same, and the state and national means were consistent. Moving over to U.S. history, um, again, relatively the same. We had a small number of kids. This used to be very, very popular. We would have 25, 30, 40 kids taking it. The past few years, it's dwindled a little bit. This year, we had nine students. Last year, we only had seven students. I really honestly don't know why that is. Um, I think a lot of our students, if they're taking some sort of exam in history, are taking we have a lot of students take the AP US history course and they take the AP exam upon completion of that. So I would think they're taking that and maybe seeing the subject test as redundant um, because the AP is a little more rigorous. Um, so they will choose to report that score because they do have that after junior year available for the application process during the senior year. Um, so I'm thinking that that's what's going on there. Um, the national and state means did drop a little bit where we only dropped a couple of points so we continue to fare well there world history is next it's a little bit of a different story we had a pretty big jump um where state and national means kind of stayed the same we had the same number of text test takers roughly 15 students this year 17 last year um typically students who are taking this exam will take are the students who are sophomores enrolled in the AP world history class as sophomores um, so those students prepare very well for the AP exam they perform very well on the AP exam the average AP score which I'll kind of jumping ahead a little bit but was a 4.58 out of 5 so they're performing very well on the AP exam, which again is more rigorous and a lot more content focused. Um, and 100% of those kids pass, which means a score of three or above on the AP scale. So I'm not quite sure why we saw a little dip there. Um, so this is something that is not changing for the future. So we will be able to see if this is a blip or if that is kind of a trend down or if fewer and fewer kids are gonna start taking this and rely on the AP exam so that we won't really see that many kids taking this anymore. All right, so that wraps up the most of the college board portion of the program this evening. So moving on to the other college entrance exam, which is the ACT. Um, traditionally, there are two tests, the SAT and the ACT. The ACT was based out of Iowa. The SAT was based out of New York. So the Midwestern section of the country, ACT was more popular, whereas the coasts tended to take the SAT. That's changing now. Pretty much everyone takes either one of them. The ACT is becoming a lot more popular um, on the coasts. It is more of a curriculum-based exam so that students don't necessarily have to do a lot of separate, separate extra prep for it. They're just prepared by taking the curriculum in school, whereas the SAT is a reasoning test. First, the students have to kind of figure out what you're being asked and then answer the question for content. Here it's pretty straightforward. We're asking you, do you know this? Um, there's a completely different way of scoring the ACT. It's 1 to 36. Um, and there are concordance tables between the two exams. So you can tell if I scored here on the SAT and I scored here on the ACT, which one did I do better on? The vast majority of students do pretty much the same on both tests but there are a small contingent of kids who feel much more comfortable with one exam over the other. So we encourage them to take the one they feel more comfortable with. Um, a lot of schools will also super score between the two exams. Um, so if you did better on the ACT and the SAT, you can kind of report both and they'll take your highest averages. Um, depending on which exam you took. So they're really looking to see how well did you do in some sort of standardized testing. It doesn't necessarily matter to them which standardized test did you take. Um, so there are four subjects on this one. Instead of just English and math and writing, there's English, math, the addition of reading, and science. The SAT says that they incorporate science through the reading and the um, the reading comprehension section of the test, whereas ACT has a distinct science section. And all sections are scored from 1 to 36, and you can get a subscore in each individual subject and then a composite score at the end. 
so here, um, our means have just been going up, which is great. We are higher than the Massachusetts and national means in every single subtest, as well as the composite score. 2008 was the first year that we had kind of um, a critical mass where we started reporting data for this test before it was, you know, a few students here and there, depending on the year. We're up to last year, 125 students in the graduating class took the ACT. So that's definitely becoming a more robust population. Um, so our means are very nice and have only gone up since we started reporting data on that. Jumping back to the college board, to the AP program. AP is advanced placement college level classes taught in high school. So um, students, if they're enrolled in an AP level class, must take the exam upon completion of the class. The, um, that part of the school shuts down for two weeks in May while AP students are taking, we offer AP, 18 AP classes, so they are testing their little hearts out in the first two weeks of May. Um, the AP exam is a four hour long exam and it's content specific. They are scored on a one to five scale. Three is considered passing. Um, so overall we had 254 students take 482 <coughs> exams. Um, if you look at just the senior class, because we offer AP to more than just the seniors, we had 136 seniors take 304 exams and that meant that 48% of the senior class took at least one AP exam, which is phenomenal. Um, Hingham last year had the highest AP scores in the state. This year we're right there. We're tied for second place um, with Westford, I believe. The first place is Georgetown, but they only had 67 total exams. So just sheer volume of the exams that we give, I still think we're number one. Um, but statistically, that's not technically correct. Um, so this slide that you're seeing now shows the um, mean score for each exam. Oh, one back, sorry, Dot. One back shows the mean score for each exam in the subjects that we give, the Massachusetts mean and the national mean. So um, we're pretty high up there. The next slide that we have, 11 courses have 100% pass rates. So a three out of five is considered passing, um, all but one are at 88% pass rates or above. Um, and that would be Latin. And this year, Latin was, it was absent for a while. We didn't have enough students to run the class. So last year was the first year that Latin had been brought back to um, availability for students to take. Then again, we compare ourselves to the benchmark schools and I kind of previewed, <laughs> we're better than all of our benchmark schools. We're a second in the state. Um, so just looking at the sheer number of exams, we have a 96% pass rate. So we are prepared phenomenally well. Um, then the next slide shows you there are several levels of rec recognition that the College Board itself gives to students who take the AP exams. So basically they start with the, the entry level is AP Scholar Award and then it goes up to Scholar with Honor, Distinction, National Scholar, International Diploma. So um, the more tests you take and the higher your scores are on those tests, kind of you move up levels in what distinction you are given. The AP International Diploma um, is a thing that you need to apply for specifically, it's for students who are intending to study outside of the country and they have to have a broad array of different disciplines um, in their AP tests represented and they apply for that and they receive the international diploma. Um, all right, and then we will end with the last slide is the National Merit Scholarship Competition. So this is given in conjunction with the PSAT. It's the, called the PSAT MNSQT. Um, so the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Contest or Qualifying Test. And if a student takes the PSAT in their junior year, they can qualify for National Merit. Um, students who score among the top 2% nationally on that test are commended and students who are in the top half of 1% of each state's high school senior class can receive recognition as semi-finalist. So we had a little drought for a while of semi-finalists, but we're back to having five of them in this year's graduating class. Um, 
So we're very pleased. And again, that's 4% of the class was recognized in the National Merit Scholarship Competition. So questions? <laughs> A lot of information to digest, a lot of tiny yeah. charts. Sorry. <laughs> yes. So you said that um, a couple times you mentioned when you're talking about the subject tests that students may not have taken the test because they took the AP. Mm -hmm. But from a college admissions perspective, that does not count, right? They still Correct. would have had to take if the they subject test. Right. If they, okay. there are, I think, oh, I forgot to check, double check my number, but I believe it's like 13% of colleges require or recommend the subject tests. So when they do require them, <coughs> yes, if they say you need two subject tests, then students have to take two subject tests. That's, they can't get around that by presenting AP exams. Okay. Scores. And could it be? I mean, I'm obviously way aged out of this, but you know, for a, for a long time, I think people just took subject tests because you figured you might need it. Right. But now that they know that they may not need it if they're not applying to those schools, could it be that they're just not taking them? That could be it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it could be that they only want to focus on what they feel very prepared for, and they may kind of wait to see what they're prepared for as they go through the curriculum and then find out that they don't need them. Right. Yeah. Okay. More information's out there, so it just seems like people yeah. may be. Right. Just, just to follow up on that, I mean, I know between my two kids, it, when my older child applied, they were more required, mm -hmm. and I felt, I feel like now, you know, some schools, I think higher level schools request them, and they'll tell you, make sure it's in English or and area. humanities right. and a math or a science. Yes. I mean, some schools, but I feel like overall, <laughs> not schools don't require them as much. Right, I'm as finding they that they're five or six years right. ago. Right, they're highly recommended but not required. Right. Also, typically, if a student takes the ACT because it is a content mm -hmm. test, they will say you either need the SAT with two subject tests or just the ACT. Right. So, with more students taking just the ACT, they kind of bypass the need to take subject tests. Admissions is changing. <laughs> Admissions is constantly <laughs> changing. <laughs> Heather, the kids, the three kids who took the molecular biology exam and the 20-something that took the uh, ecological, are they in the same classroom? Typically, yes. Did mm -hmm. any of the kids who took, who took the molecular also take the ecological? No, I don't yeah. believe so. Actually, I can go back and look at that, but usually they would take them on the June test date. So they can't take both on the same day. Brad. Um, uh, I took that test. Yes, and the molecular. You, uh, uh, I'm not, I think I took the ecological, yep. right? Maybe one of them, but what happens is you go through, I believe, some odd questions, and then it says whether you want to take this test, mm -hmm. skip to question 60, do these, or if you want to take this test, just continue with the test and so stop here. Part of the test So you can only same. take one or the other. <laughs> Thank you. Are the PSATs given to sophomores as, as practice? So that's a longer story than you think it might be. Um, there, so there used to be, historically, the PSAT, which is the practice SAT, and the plan, which was a practice ACT, for years and years and years. And then the ACT people discontinued the plan and put in this like achieve works something that didn't necessarily predict your ACT score <coughs> and it was scored completely differently and we just didn't see the benefit of taking that test when we had a bunch of other tests that wasn't going to inform you whether the ACT was a better test for you or not. So for a few years, mm, two years maybe, that kind of was a void. So then in addition to that, the College Board, in its wisdom, rolled out the new SAT, and they decided last year that they would only offer a Wednesday test date, not also a Saturday test date that Hingham typically used So for the PSAT. So we found ourselves in this, we have to give it during school, we're going to give it to all the juniors, we have nothing for the sophomores, why don't we offer it to the sophomores too since it's going to be during the school day. So we offered it to the sophomores and the juniors for that one year, and then the freshmen and seniors continued on with their regular courses. And then this year, um, 
the pre-ACT popped up from the ACT people who would give students a sense of does the ACT work as a test for me. So we offered the pre-ACT to the sophomores and the PSAT to the juniors. So students in the current junior class had the opportunity to take it twice as a sophomore and then as a junior. Um, this year you could only opt to take it as a junior because we offered the pre-ACT to the sophomores. So that answer. Um, I had two questions. Um, with the students, we have a handful of students taking the online courses. Yes, in the BHS, are those yeah. AP <coughs> students incorporated into these numbers as well? And is for the most part, yes. But I did not. We have so few students taking each, so I think we had like two economic students and two environmental science students. So I didn't, they're in the global numbers, but they're, I didn't report on those tests individually. Not those two, but right. if they took other tests, those, yes, they were one was, of those students who tested. Were they comparable to the students taking the A course in the class? A little bit lower, but again, there's only one or two <coughs> students to choose from. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't, I can't quite make meaning of it yet until this is only the third year yeah. that we've offered VHS, second year that, okay. So there were, yeah, two years, we're currently in the third year offering VHS, so, and students have been taking different, so it's not like we have a cohort taking environmental science year after year after year, so it's kind of hard to say. Yeah. But the couple students, it has been slightly lower. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, in light of student stress, and are we exploring the idea of would we ever limit the number of AP courses that a student would be suggested at taking or even per um, year or so? Yeah, it's, it's been a conversation every once in a while. There's never been a robust movement to have it be a very full discussion, but I think if there were interest, it would definitely, we would want to do our due diligence and find out more information because there are some schools some schools don't even offer AP classes some schools do limit the number total that you can take some limit by the number per year that you can take um, so yeah we have not ever actually looked into that but it comes up every once in a while. But as a department you really never uh, suggested that students take five AP courses. Oh, no. I mean I know from no. my own experience you've actually said you know think about that. And right. When counselors two meet three, with students, one or, one or two, right. depending on the student. Right, right. When teachers recommend levels of classes for the next year, so we rely on their content knowledge, obviously. And then um, when counselors have conversations with students, we can say, you know, yes, you've been recommended for six of them. Can you remain a normal, balanced kid mm -hmm. and have a social life and play sports and participate in debate club and do all that you want to yeah. do. So um, the conversation, and that is from, depending on the student, whatever level they're recommended for, we want to say, you know, just because we think you can intellectually handle this is <coughs> a good idea. Right. Because we do want to make sure that students are not burnt out and that they're functioning at their full capacity. So maybe you want, if your interest lies in a certain area, sure. specialize right. in that and maybe tone it down a little bit in other areas so that you can succeed right. where you're, it's most important for you. Yeah, because yeah, yep. the town comparison, it was a little hard when I was, I was thinking about that when I looked at the chart you had for mm -hmm. town comparisons Benchmark. of number of courses and then how they score. But then I realized, oh, well, the student population is different, and yeah. so it I like gave up on that one. Maybe. Right. So it wasn't going to look up <laughs> the student population. Right. It's hard. It's time. hard because a lot of towns, they may limit or they may say, like, there's the philosophy out there that even just exposure to an AP class, whether you're successful in it or not, right. goes a long way in college yeah. readiness. So for towns that may not have the high college going percentage that we have, they're opening up their AP classes to anyone yeah. and making an open enrollment just so they get the rigor. Mm -hmm. um, so we are pretty rigorous all around in all levels <laughs> here. Okay, all right. any other questions on that topic? Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, if, if anyone from the audience has a question on the topic, please. Okay, so next, which I think a lot of people are here to hear about, 6.4 to hear a report from the Hingham High School GPA Task Force and act on any recommended 
change. Um, and this, I will say, this GPA task force was an issue raised by some parents, and there was a lot of good due diligence done on this, um, and <coughs> this took some time, and but it was slow and steady, and we addressed it at a school committee meeting last June, um, and then revisited in July and set a plan in July um, to form a committee come the beginning of school, and I believe that was done right at the beginning of the school year, and we're here with a December report. So that was um, nice, steady work, patience from parents, which we appreciate, um, but I think we got some place, so. We did. So, yeah, first I just want to start off by thanking everyone who was involved. Um, a lot of people contributed to the committee process, and everyone's hard work, I think, really paid off and we've drawn some conclusions for this issue, which is nice. Um, so we did form a committee, and the purpose was to examine and evaluate its Hingham High School's current GPA determination. Um, the biggest takeaway is Hingham's scale is different from other high school scales in that it is a 4.0 scale currently based on the honors level, whereas um, many other schools do it based on the college preparatory level. So. so as I said in my initial report, one of the goals for the stu school, stu school improvement plan this year was to examine the current practice of calculating and reporting GPAs and to make a recommendation to the superintendent. So we have done that. And the, as Liza said, we formed a committee and the list of the committee members is on the next slide. It, Heather was the chair of that committee. I was on it. One of the other school counselors, our post-secondary planning coordinator, Kathleen Savory was on it. Carol was the school committee rep. And we had three parents. And as you can see, they have students in many years. So we had a nice spread from back from 2015 all the way up 2022. 2010 to 2010. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so we have years. a good spread. And these were the people who just physically came to all the meetings. We had lots of input from other parents through emails and other sources of information. But these, this was the group that was able to meet during the school day. We really felt we had three outcome options, three ways we could go. We could keep the current GPA calculation as it was, we could adopt the new GPA calculation, or we could report no GPA, which is something you might not have thought of, but something we certainly did consider along the lines. Just to give you a historical background where we were, the original uh, GPA scale is there, as Heather said earlier, we ba it was a 6.0 schedule, I, 6.0, I know when I first came to Hingham I thought, oh, a 6 oh, that was something different for me, but as we talked around there are uh, many, many different uh, GPA scales, but this happened to be the one that Hingham was using back, I came in 2000, and that was the one that was in place then, and it was normed off the honest level. In 2008, we switched from a 6.0 to a 4.0, and we did it simply for mathematical, it was a simply a mathematical change. We didn't have any philosophical discussion about how we centered it. We thought we wanted to use a more familiar scale, and that was the 4.0. Most people were familiar with that. So we just changed the numbers. There was no philosophical discussion about why we did the leveling the way it was done. It was, a, it was no change other than simply numbers. That was all that we did there. So considerations, um, there were a few things that we wanted to make sure that we included as part of our process. So the philosophy behind the GPA being centered on the honors level, um, was there a compelling reason that it was that way? Um, then the belief that colleges make preliminary cuts based on GPA and or test scores rather than holistically considering an application, we wanted to make sure we either could um, we just got some data to support whether that did happen or whether that didn't happen. Um, there was a concern that GPA, the current GPA scale that we're using disadvantaged students in the college admissions process, and then um, merit awards were just a whole nother factor of um, if it's part of the admissions process or if it's a separate entity and how does that kind of go into the whole calculation and how is that used. So we looked at um, obviously we needed a lot of data from a lot of different sources so the next slide shows you kind of all of the sources of data that we had we did a lot of surveying of college admissions representatives um, we had <coughs> conversations with rep representatives from NACAC 
um, which is kind of the gov governing body of college admissions counseling. We have every year Kathy Savory, our post-secondary planning coordinator, meets with 137, well, the number varies slightly from year to year, but college admissions representatives who come to our high school in person and do info sessions for the kids. So she met with every single one of them um, over last year and this year. We had a presentation from college admissions representatives directly to our committee this year. We last year had a college <coughs> admissions panel um, that presented to parents. We gathered data from benchmark schools. We did a statistical analysis of admissions rates at the top 100 colleges applied to by high Hingham students. Um, we referenced the Harvard Graduate School of Education Turning the Tides report. Um, and again, we took information from NACAC. So what did we find? Well, the number one thing we found was there is no standard method of calculating GPA. Many people <coughs> think that there is a, a, a formula that is followed across <coughs> the country. There is not. There simply is not a standard method of calculating GPAs. There are as many ways to determine the GPA as there are schools and colleges. And we did find that the GPA is typically based on the college prep level, so we were not the norm in that case. It was typically on the college prep. However, <coughs> GPA is a term you all know. We learned a new one, SOC, strength of curriculum. That, is, that appears to be the more important factor when determining college admissions, the strength of the curriculum, which we will define later. And we also learned, which was something I think a lot of people were concerned about, the job of a college admission, admissions rep is to get to know his or her communities, the schools that he or she visits regularly, to fam be familiar with the program offerings, the curriculum, and the strength of that curriculum. So I think in kind of public shorthand, GPA <coughs> signifies um, the grades a student has earned and the strength of the curriculum, but people call it GPA. So that's kind of what it's come to be known as. And I think it's important to mention that the committee found that there really isn't any evidence that students were disadvantaged by um, in the admissions process by the GPA that we had. Um, but colleges always reiterated that what the school counseling profession um, believed and that's admissions reps know that each school is different they take that into consideration when they are reviewing an admissions file and they make it a point to examine the transcript and the reported high school um, information to give a student context and they most often review students in a school cohort so that all Hingham High School students, for instance, would be kind of looked at together to make an admissions decision, not that they're admitted as a group or not as a group, but just to give um, the same group of kids who had the same curricular offerings the same opportunities. So they're comparing like to like versus a Hingham High School student um, with another school that may not even have AP classes, whereas we do so well on them. So they want to make sure that they're comparing students who've had similar opportunities. Um, so strength of curriculum versus GPA. According to NACAC, um, they did a state of college admissions report. They do this every so often. The top four factors are grades are the most important thing. So grades in college preparatory classes, the strength of curriculum, then they look at grades overall, so even in those courses that aren't necessarily considered major courses, and then they do look at SAT scores as well. This was a quote from one of the admissions officers that we thought summed up things nicely. The GPA itself is not meaningful without context from the transfer. So to get a list of you know straight A's, that is a meaningless statistic unless you get the context, the school from where that came. So strength of curriculum, it's a misconception that most colleges have a minimum cutoff, which we were very pleased to hear, um, that each application is considered holistically prior to any admissions decision. So they're not seeing a certain GPA and then saying, sorry, you're in the no pile. Um, and what we really heard over and over again from admissions representatives is that even large universities find a way to make meaning of a student's transcript before they even make a decision to deny or to move a student further along in the process. So um, they mentioned that some of the larger universities will employ a cadre of trained counselors who may come in just for the admissions season so that they are thoroughly trained in how to evaluate an application and they may make initial reads and then pass some information on to the committee that then makes decisions. So um, 
I think we were very pleased to hear that someone's not just looking at the number on the top of a piece of paper and putting someone into a no pile because that we definitely did not want to I think do. it's also interesting to note some of the councils had the opportunity to go to Holy Cross and actually yeah. sit in on an application discussion. It was quite interesting. Some of the applications were looked at by as many as six people or six groups of people before a final decision was made. So it really is quite, quite a thorough process. Right. And as this another nice quote shows, every single high school provides a different GPA, different courses, and we would be doing a large disservice to our applicants if we treated them all the same. So admissions oh, trends, yeah. um, turning the tide, the report published by the Harvard Graduate School of Education and they, all of the Ivy League signed on and a number of um, colleges and universities signed on as well. I actually emailed that out at the end of last mm -hmm. year to all the parents on in, in the high school. And I know in, for the school committee members, it was a hyperlink in the report, so you mm -hmm. can link right to it. Um, I believe we have the link also on the high school counseling website. I'll double check that as well when I go back to make sure that if anyone wants to access that full report, you have access to it. Um, but one thing that they're kind of saying that colleges want to do as a group is reshape the admissions process and promote greater ethical engagement among aspiring students. Um, they want to reduce the pressure, which is something that we talk about all the time, level the playing field as much as they can, especially for economically disadvantaged students. So I think what they're doing is they're not just admitting the kids with the highest grades and the highest test scores and that's the end of it they're trying to shape a class in a given year and look for diverse points of view and diverse talents and bring geographical diversity um, so they're really trying to shape a class to give a class at their university character um, so most um, students well maybe not most students but many of the students who apply to a college in a given year could actually do the work academically if they were landed on that college campus but because of the admissions process and the number of students that colleges can admit they necessarily have to reject a number most of the qualified students that apply to their school we talked with UMass and they um, shared with us their admissions presentation so it's good to see that even a large school like that does a holistic review of an application um, and again they're seeking diverse students who will contribute fully to campus so they're not I mean they have great standards but they're not looking at specific um, thresholds necessarily just because you have a, have a 4 doesn't mean you're automatically in okay all right moving on oh. that's the first of that yeah Oops. Merit Award was a little trickier. There was a great variation between the colleges and universities what they do is for some don't even have merit. But the purpose of merit is to attract candidates, the top candidates in the pool, to come and to stay every single year. And of course, that process is outside the financial aid process. This is a merit, so they're not looking at aid. And often they might be looking for a particular characteristic, so they may be looking for a special talent. Maybe they need a tuba player or, you know, the baton girl, the, the marching band, something along those lines. So they can, some schools do use merit for that. So this was a little trickier to get a handle on. It does vary from year to year, and that depends on the school's endowment, the stock market obviously affecting that, the strength of the applica applicant pool. Some year you could be a great applicant, maybe the next year you're not so good in that pool. And as we said earlier, the need to diversify the incoming class in some particular way. Interesting to note that applying as a woman now, when I applied to school, was a more of a rarity. Now colleges are fighting to, to keep that balance on a campus because most schools have more women than men. So it's very, that's definitely been an interesting change over the years. And of course, simply meeting a GPA or SAT benchmark doesn't guarantee a merit award. They may say if you have a 3 you you're guaranteed. And if it's a particularly affluent school, maybe it is. But for the most part, that's the beginning of the process. So, so what do we recommend as the result of all this research and all the input we had? So we are recommending Opt this particular option, we still will report a GPA. We're not going to stay the same. There's no reason to do that. We're going to change our method to center the 4 on the college preparatory level. And there is a chart. Oops, sorry. Um, so before we go to the oh, chart, okay. I think it's just good for us to note that um, even though we found that there wasn't really any evidence of students being disadvantaged by the current HHS scale, there really wasn't any compelling mm -hmm. reason to stay with it. Um, so we didn't want to just stay with something because we could. 
we decided that we always did it that way right exactly yeah, so um we want to go to something that kind of was more common that was a little more familiar than what we thought we had moved to a familiar process in the first place so this is the new scale it is uh, adapted from the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education that's what the MDHE stands for so they govern all of the state colleges and universities and they set the GPA scale for those entities so that kind of just made sense as a reference point for us the only difference is they only have three levels of curriculum whereas we have four so we adapted it to add the fourth level so you'll see um, it's a little difficult, but the 4.0 is now at the A level in the college prep level class. see the red 4 in the middle. So that's the red 4 right where Dot's cursor was. And, of course, the level 4 standard level is taken into account. Yeah, we were not going to leave out those students. That would be unfair and I think unconscionable. Because some of those students do go on to further education, community colleges or whatever. So to say you can't have a GPA seems to me discriminatory. So we added that. We let, okay, we have, the, the MDHE scale only has three levels, AP level one, honors, level two, and level three college prep. Okay. We offer a fourth level of instruction at Hingham High School, as do a lot of schools. They don't include that level in calculating GPA, which to my mind is saying, you kids can never go to college, which is. What's the name of the fourth level? Four, level four? Standard. Oh, yeah. For us. Yeah. Level four. Yeah. Yeah. So we include that. It is different from level three, and it's not the same, but we want to differentiate between the two, and we want it to include it. And I think at the MDHE, they're saying level four standard classes are typically not, not college preparatory. They're a little bit below that. But we have a number of students who may need reme remediation in certain areas. So it may be for their first year, they're taking an English or a math class based on their learning disability at the level four, but then they kind of go up into the college preparatory curriculum. So if we didn't give any weighting to that fourth level, we didn't want to say just that like, oh, those don't count towards mm -hmm. college, but there was a way to incorporate those into the GPA, if that makes sense. Is that clear? Okay. So, implementation. Whoops. Oh, okay. So as you know, the current seniors had the option. They could report the Hingham High School GPA alone, or they could also report the MDHE together. They could report both of those. They couldn't just report the MDHE. They had to report both. So we would recommend the full implementation of this plan with the current sophomores. We stopped reporting, G they had a GPA for the first three terms of last year, but then we stopped there. And we did not report any GPAs on the first term report cards. We would like to start using this plan for the current freshmen and the current sophomores. The current freshmen never had a reported GPA, and the current sophomores, as I said, we stopped. For the class of 2018, we would continue giving them the same choice we give the current seniors. They could pick to report just the Hingham High GPA or to report them both. They can do it either way. The only ca caveat we would add, if we get some feedback after the end of this admissions process that reporting two, two GPAs was problematic, we would reevaluate that. I don't think we will, but we just want to hold that just in case. The admissions process uh, applications, we're just learning about acceptances. So far, we've heard nothing that would make us think that. But just in case we do, we would then re-examine it. But the plan would be to do for the current juniors what we did for the current seniors, and then switch over totally for sophomore year. So that would be, normally we would start with a freshman class, but we stopped reporting last year because we knew we were, we were re-evaluating and we would go from there. And then one thing we do want to recommend for the future is to take a look at this every four years. One year is not going to give us the kind of data to, to decide if this made any difference. As Heather said earlier, this is a year with a new SAT, a new system of correcting the ACT. We're also not noticing the trend that some schools, as Carol mentioned, are going test optional. They're not requiring any tests, never mind SAT subject tests. And we're seeing that, that trend toward this ethical um, engagement that Harvard and the other Ivies were pushing. So we don't, one year is not enough data. So we think every four years would probably be a good time mm -hmm. to take a look at the GPA and see what conclusions we can draw, if any. And do we still need a GPA? Who knows, four years from now we might have a whole different plan. But for now, this is what we would recommend with 
the recommendation to study this again in four years or earlier if we found something pop up before then right. but certainly at a minimum in four years right. oh because as we said these one are the, thing right one yeah. thing we did find is that um, just like when class rank began to mm. be a wave where that was being eliminated that started with the private schools private high schools private high schools have now started to not report GPA so we don't know if that's going to be kind of a tidal wave or it'll just stick with them so we want to kind of remain abreast of any mm. changes in the admissions world um, and adjust and adapt to make sure that our students are getting um, put in their best light in the college admissions office uh, process and we will put this whole report up on the website so you yep. can see the whole thing and that will have the hyperlink to the Harvard report that Heather mentioned so that is our recommendation Oh. <laughs> um, we're going to do school committee comments and then we'll do audience comments. Alec, could we have the lights, please? Thank you. <coughs> we're back. Um, Carol, you were on the committee. Do you have anything to add? Or? No, I think it was a great experience. I think we had some very experienced parents on the committee that have been through the process mm -hmm. and have kids coming up in the wings. Um, There's some great um, give and take. I, I personally found the whole option of reporting no GPA at all, which I think Cynthia had <laughs> suggested <laughs> at some point, thrown out there, not suggested, um, intriguing and I'll be <coughs> interested to follow mm. and see where that trend goes. Mm. Um, but I think that there seemed to be and from the committee standpoint, there seemed to be no reason to stick with something when a number of our peers were reporting differently and the UMass system was basing it differently. So, trying to be consistent. Anybody else? Carl? Well, I, um, I want to sort of like uh, reiterate uh, what Eliza mentioned in the beginning that, you know, this is uh, highlights how when parents, administration, uh, and school committee comes together, things happen. So, I mean, this six months ago, you know, it's when we started talking about this, thanks to some parents. I believe right now, and I would like to put it out there, is we are this, having another discussion with the special ed. This is, uh, you know, uh, something that special ed groups can learn from, that, you know, um, it takes time. Things cannot, will not happen overnight. But when we work together, uh, changes can happen. So. Let's just learn, and I applaud the parents to come forward and work with the administration. And this whole process, I, I was not part of it directly, but indirectly I have, have been trying to learn as much as I can, so I applaud everyone. Thank you. Thank you. During the summer when this issue came up, I, I thank the uh, parent group as a whole for bringing it to our attention. And again, I would thank uh, two individual parents who sought me out individually uh, because I think it was uh, a real accomplishment. Any other comments, questions? I thought it was great, very thorough, and you provided us with even more detail, and so I appreciate that. So now, um, in the back, or Brad, actually, you want to make a comment first, and then I'll take the gentleman in the back. Please come up. Yeah. Um, could we possibly go back to the PowerPoint? Which one was yeah, it? Which one we, we have it here? Senior 20, yes. the one talking that showed the new GPA scale. Yep. Yes. So seniors were able to um, email their guidance counselor yep. last year and ask for the updated one. Is or the one based off the MG MG yep. scale? Is that? going to change with this new scale or will it be most likely the same? Well, the current juniors will be able to do just what you did, pick yeah. either one to report, because it does affect where, you know, there's a, some people go up, some people go down. But following that, then everybody will be on the 4.0 scale, dormed off level three rather than level two. Is that what you're asking? So me? really the only difference between the one that I received last year, like the one that I asked my accounts counsel yes. for and the one this year is that they now account for the level three course? 
or the, the no, 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 the it's the same. Mm-hmm. It's the oh. same. It's, it's right. the same. Yep. We, we adapted it last year. We adapted it last year too. It is the exact same way. But, but the correct. difference will be that this year, if you chose the MDHE, you had to report both that and the Hingham, the current Hingham High School GPA. That will be the same next and year. And that will be well. the same next year. But the yep. following year, it'll only be correct. the newly right. proposed. There won't be two anymore. Right. There will just be one. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Brad. Okay. Gentlemen, back. Can you come up to the microphone and um, say your name, please? Uh, my name is Kevin Quilty. Um, a question for you. You had mentioned, I believe, you said no one in the admissions process was disadvantaged because of strength of schedule. I'm mean, sorry, strength of curriculum. We found no evidence to right. suggest that. That is correct. Um, were people disadvantaged in terms of merit? That's the one thing That's we don't. We, we don't, don't know. often know who gets merit. They don't always tell us that. We don't know. And merit is based basically on a pretty much hardcore scale. Oh, this is a question. It's not no, a what we found was that as, a certain level. as varied as it is in the admissions process, it's even more varied in the merit process. So first of all, not every college offers merit even to begin with. Some schools just simply don't offer it. The colleges that do all look at it individually. So they may have their own um, guidelines. Some schools offer an application process to get into the merit pool. Some consider students, any student who applies automatically as part of their process. Um, some on their websites, I think what we found was there's a lot of variation in that too. Some will say the bare minimum requirement is you must have an X GPA and X test scores. But then very often when we dug a little bit deeper, there's fine print saying, well, but someone who got a 4.0 but only took college prep level classes did not have the high strength of curriculum that we have come to know and love. Um, So someone maybe with a 3.7 would get merit aid over a 4.0 because they took higher level classes and challenged themselves. From the same school? Coming from the same school. Yep, (coughs) but there also is no, there's a lot of individual qualities that they kind of take into account so they won't it's not like if you meet this threshold you get it you have to meet that threshold but then there are a number of other qualities that they're looking for that they may not tell you they may not publicize and it may be different like we said from one graduating class to another because they're looking to diversify in a different way from one year over another so what we found out is that it's very muddy and there is no global thing that we can do to address that because it is so individual. But we did say for those schools who do say like, yes, you won't be considered unless you have this GPA, at least if we norm ours on the college prep level, that at least gets more kids, we think, in the door of meeting that initial threshold to be considered. And is that what you found other schools on kind of a list that we compare ourselves to doing the same thing? We didn't really look, no high school really know, like we don't get an answer of kids who tell us if they even received merit aid. So there could be tens of kids who are getting awards that they never share with us. So that's really an unknown. Could we start tracking some data saying, you know, please not only inform us of your, I have enough hard enough time getting them to tell me where they got into schools, much less <laughs> did you get merit aid as well, but we can always make that part of a survey that we give to our seniors every year. Were you awarded merit aid at the schools that you were accepted to? So. And then one other thing, sorry if you addressed this and I just missed it, but if you have someone in the, like, in your class this year that had two potential GPAs or yep. someone in <coughs> junior class this year that will have two. Say you have two students both applying just to, to, to UMass, say, mm-hmm. and one chooses one way and one chooses the other. Does that matter? Does that get confusing to them? Or how does that, how does that work? We worried about that. Yes. But we have, and that's one of the reasons why we're holding off absolutely committing to two. I mean, we're 99% there, but we want to see if we get any feedback. We haven't got anything yet negatively because the council, the um, (laughs) admissions reps do know what we're doing. Uh, Kathy Savory's met with many of them, the 137 that came to school and explained it. I'm sorry, I just think I misunderstood you. So you're you're not committing to two? No, I said we... Students can... That is our plan. More. However, we are just holding, we want to put the caveat out there in case we hear something as the admissions process rolls on that makes us concerned that that was a problem, we want to step back and look at it again. 
we don't anticipate that, but I just want to put that out there in case we learn something. But also from like the UMass example that happens to be a school that tells us it really doesn't matter if you report 27 GPAs, we throw them out and we right. recalculate based on our own system. So the majority of schools tend to do that. They will not. To oh, yes. Yes. Not. Every school across the country? Not, no, 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 no. A majority, but not all of yeah. them. So it depends on the school. Another thing that we heard is if a school doesn't recalculate the GPA and they have two students from Hingham High School, one reports two GPAs and one reports one, they look for the commonality. So they may look at the GPA that is common to both of those students. Okay, that's the part I misunderstood. I misunderstood. So the juniors this year, as well as I think the seniors this year, mm -hmm. they don't get two printed. They, they can, choose, they can choose. They can get two, yes. but they can choose one over the other. No. no. They can choose the HHS GPA only, right. or they can choose the HHS GPA along with the MDAG. They could not just select the MDAG by itself because that was well, not a GPA we had be officially. The they, will that will be one. their only choice. Yep, because that will be our official GPA. Correct. Yeah. And because they've never had another GPA before. But the juniors haven't. Yes, they have. GPA. No, they haven't given their GPA to anyone. In the no, but they have. No, they but haven't they given have it, maybe but it's been reported for two years. And understanding right. that they had a certain GPA. Mm -hmm. So now they have the option of putting both on, whereas the freshmen and sophomores have not. Is that clear? Okay. Do people feel it was for you? But Trish. Come on. I'll go to the mic. Yeah. No, it's all right. <laughs> There's no no small question questions. is small. <laughs> so on the transcripts, did people feel it was pretty clear? Or was yes. It we have clarified the transcript so that it, certain things are highlighted in red. We make it very clear. HHS GPA 4.0 is at the honors level. 3.0, or the college prep level is a 3.5 in that case. If you're doing the MDHE, it's a different scale. So that's right on the transcript okay. it is also right on the school profile that we send with every single um, school part of the application process that goes to colleges and we write that in the letter of recommendation so there's like nine different places nine is not accurate I'm many. hyperbolizing yeah. but many different instances in an application process where we're explaining what we're doing so that's exceedingly clear Kathy with every single Hingham rep that came to the admissions rep that came to Hingham High School explained it again while pointing to our profile, so we really feel like we hopefully did a good job that people can't miss okay. what Thanks. we're doing. Yes. Hi, I'm Kathy Savory, the post-secondary planning coordinator. I just want to um, reiterate just one fact that might help in understanding. Um, when I met with the 137 reps that came through this year, 80% um, of the schools that I met with recalculate the GPA. And that's only a small sample, um, but it just kind of gives us a context as to a lot of the colleges are recalculating our GPA no matter which GPA we report. Um, and then in addition, just to kind of back that up, NACAC in their 2015 report um, commented that um, over 50% of the schools are recalculating recal the GPAs as well. So just to kind of hone in on that, Regardless of which GPA scale we were using, they were recalculating it anyways, just so that they had all of their schools on the same, you know, level when they're reviewing the applications. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do Brad, and then I'll do okay. in the blue. Oh. I wanted to ask her on her comment. Yes. Go ahead. Yep. So you say they recalculate it. Is that recalculating for admission, or is that recalculating for merit? Well, um, because because I, I find that there's a difference. I know what you're saying. But. Typically, and I don't know, I can't say, you know, per school, but typically when they recalculate, they're using that same GPA for the merit award. But I mean, it, it varies yeah. school to school, but right, right. the majority are doing it I, for I both. I didn't know if the 80% said we use that recalculated GPA when we're looking. Typically, right. it's for both, but um, I mean, I can't answer for each school. Brad, you want to contribute? So when the yeah. two GPAs are reported, if a student does choose to make that choice, um, are they reported immediately next to each other? Yes. Or does, okay, because I remember, like, it used to be where it was going to just, you were going to have the Hingham GPA and then in a smaller, like, comment box or, like, extra, no. it was going to be reported in second. Yeah, they're no. right up at the top of the text box at the top center of the transcript, so it's right there. And because we transmit everything electronically, 
it's in red as well to super highlight. You can see us if you want, Brad. I'm happy to give you a copy. Okay, any Yeah, Eugene. <coughs> I just have, I'm Eugenie Murray Brown. Um, I just had a question about the level three and four. I know when I was looking at what different mm -hmm. schools did, I noticed that a lot of schools don't have a different um, weighting for level four. It's not that they don't have a weighting, they just don't bring it down. High schools or colleges? High schools. Okay. So looking at the people in our benchmark group, mm -hmm. I noticed that you know some of them, I don't remember what the number was, but a lot of them don't bother taking away points from the kids that are in level four classes. They're already kind of disadvantaged in some ways because they're in level four classes, I mean, in terms of their GPA. Is there a real reason why we have to make their A worth three five or their D, you know, their C worth one five, which is not considered passing? Mm -hmm. Can we, have we considered just having one weight for level three or four? Because that is something that a lot of schools do and I think I don't think that hurts anyone. I mean, I'm, I think we don't need to make the level four GPAs so low. If there was a way that we could consider doing that, it might be something that would be worthwhile doing. Um, it was just a comment, <laughs> um, unless you have a response. But the other, um, the other question I had was, I've heard a couple of different families this year have problems because what was decided was you could get the two GPAs if you were in the class of 2017 we did not let people who are trying to transfer to a different college get their GPA recalculated, and we did not let people who are sophomores who are getting looked at for sports get a different GPA. So I think that has really, you know, possibly hurt those kids. I think, I thought we had decided, you know, that we would let anyone who needed a transcript printed this year get both GPAs. And maybe that's something we need to think about um, especially for the kids, you know, that might be transferring to a different college, to have them have a GPA that's lower than what a four three two one GPA would be, it seems unfair. Just to respond to that point, yeah. most students, if they're transferring from a college, the college that of they're course. transferring to is looking primarily at the college they grades, are. not really at the high school grades anymore, and then the other classes we didn't have any official decision yet so that's why we kind of put a hold and said the only GPA that Hingham High School technically has right now is the Hingham High School method of calculation so that because we didn't know what we were doing moving forward we I think we're always as clear as we could be that that was going to be for the senior class only and then we were making a determination is that something as to what that we could happen. consider for those people who need a transcript printed today you if they a need a transcript course. either to send to a coach or to send to a I think college if they're a freshman that are trying to transfer as a sophomore they still look at the high school transcript and for those kids to be able to have the same benefit that the current seniors have just seems like something that would be something we would want to offer to them so what happens on a official high school transcript the GPA isn't even reported until after the sixth semester. So someone who is a sophomore, there is no GPA no matter what the system is reported on so a transcript. January, right? That would be when it's after the junior year, or after right. the sixth, full so sophomore right, this year. This is only will be the third semester. Oh, so okay, it's not so on the official transcript until after the okay, junior so, year. So, okay, but for a current junior, if they need to get a transcript in January, could they have the option of having both GPAs? it still won't appear on the transcript. Like that field doesn't pull oh, okay. until they finish until their seniors. junior year. Right. Oh. Yeah. Yep. Um, all, you will, but I want to follow up with Dr. Gallo and maybe if you want to answer also the first question. I just wanted to comment on the, on the level four because yeah. certainly, you know, I do think it's important to, uh, for our students to be able to present their performance in a in a positive light and particularly thinking of that whole issue of equity and so on that's an interesting suggestion I would point out that level four is a bit different in that we we don't really have kids who take all level four because we don't offer level four courses and everything so typically children are taking level four and level three courses somebody might even have a level two course in there mm -hmm. and so you need to keep that in mind that uh, there wouldn't be students who are only in that level four column 
Uh, the second point it would make is that because level four courses are, are an effort to provide for students at the level of their functioning, we very seldom have students in getting D's and F's in level four courses because they're more individualized for those students. So, you know, I, I, it's an interesting suggestion to look at, but um, level four is uh, somewhat different from the other levels in those, in those two ways and just something to keep in mind. Okay, so are we done on Eugenie's point? Okay, then. <coughs> Very helpful to understand that hey, the GPA. Can we have your name first? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Kathy Hartman. Okay. And it's helpful to understand that the GPA is not generally on the curriculum until after junior year. Okay. But given that we've had uh, blank GPAs on the report cards mm -hmm. yes. for the freshmen and sophomores who will only have the new GPA, when can we expect to see that on report cards? That is, I'm hoping, maybe Pending in Dr. January. Gallo's decision. And if we All can make it well. work, technically, yeah. we sh I see no reason why we couldn't report it starting after the first semester. And that's Fabulous. report cards at the end of January, so. Great. Thank you. Sorry, did I speak for you? No, no. Okay. I, I, uh, <laughs> Th that was a temporary uh, issue mm -hmm. that yep. we were trying yep. to resolve in terms of not giving out information that was in incorrect. So I would like for us to res yes. revert to our I prior agree. practice. And his historically, um, when I first came here, no one was given their GPA at all until the end of their junior year. And then as counselors, we were dealing with sometimes shocked students who were like, well, what do you mean this is my GPA and now I'm applying in like three months and there's nothing mm. I can do about my GPA because it was shouted, shrouded in mystery. So we were strong proponents mm -hmm. um, of reporting Fresh the GPA meaning. early and often so that students can track their progress and they know exactly what their GPA is. Um, so I think, yes, it's very important to get that back on the, G on the report card as soon as humanly so possible. Just, just as a follow-up to the question about sophomores that may need to show their GPA to, for, for athletic purposes, they would have, once it's on their, on their report cards, they, can right, show they would have that card. document Correct. that would indicate what their current GPA is after January. we finish the first semester, mm -hmm. which would be in January. So yeah. that, that resolves that problem. Yeah. Correct. And again, it's mostly, mostly the classes that they're taking and the grades that they're getting, not necessarily that GPA number itself is what people are looking for. Can, can you come up to the, can you come up to the, my name? I just wanted to ask about when that GPA will be in their report card. We hope January. January. The next report card would be the end of January, and that is our goal to have it on that. Just the current grade point, not No, for the freshmen and sophomores, it would be the new one. We'll have to, uh, I don't think we can print two on a report card, right? We'd have to have Yeah, a, that's the uh, discussion we're going to have out. to have with our tech people. Yeah. Right. Well, there's yep. MDHE calculator yeah. on the website. And a student can see their that, counselor so. anytime okay. to get both versions yeah. of the GPA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that worked very well with the senior class. Mm -hmm. Whenever they needed it, just mm -hmm. go to the counselor yep. and communicate. And parents can call the counselor to call email. To get that information. Yep. You, how many how many seniors did you find did report both roughly was it a significant number? it was about 50 50 yep because I think what we saw when we broke down mm. the two methods of calculating 50 percent went up and fit or 53 percent went up and 47 went down or whatever it was so it broke right along those lines 47 said stay with the HHS the others went with two yep. no surprise there okay. Are we done with questions Okay. Um, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That is it for our high school reports time. Um, Actually, so do we want to take a vote? Yeah. yeah. Whatever we want to take These help? are all changes that I recommend, in okay. addition to the one that was just spoken about in terms of the report card reference, okay. and so I would recommend that um, to you. So I would make a, a motion that we um, change the method of GPA calculation to a 4.0 centered on a college preparatory level. 
This will begin with the class of 2019. <laughs> and that we continue um, allowing the class of 2018 to report either the high school, the current high school GPA, or both the current high school GPA and the adapted MDAG GPA as well. I'll second that. Okay. okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So we'll do it. Thank you. Okay. 6.5 to act on the proposed superintendent goals for 2016-2017. So um, I'm now reverting back <laughs> to the slide I was going to be oh. all ready with. <laughs> okay. <laughs> until um, uh, we talked about this. Uh, you saw this document at the last uh, meeting and uh, um, Kay raised a question um, and um, I rethought it. Um, also um, went and listened to um, the meeting that occurred uh, a week or so ago and thought about that more and so have changed the wording in one of the goals a bit. The rest of it is all um, as it was the last time you saw it. So, here we are. I would mention as I'm locating this that I think there's a lot of confusion about, and maybe because we haven't ever explained it very well, but when we talk about goals, there are so many different ty kinds of goals that, that we talk about. In connection with educator evaluation, uh, every, ed uh, every educator has to identify uh, goals each year. Uh, teachers have to have two goals, uh, building uh, administrators and um, uh, folks like department directors and so on have four goals, and I have five or six goals. Uh, these are part of the educator evaluation process, and they are individual, and as part of educator evaluation, with the exception of my role, they're not things that are made public beyond that. The goals are submitted to their superiors, and they're part of that process. So it's one kind of goal. Uh, Paula's report tonight was uh, one that we have for each of the buildings, and that each building has a school council and there are school council improvement goals that are part of the defined role of a school council. So that's another kind of goal. We have a strategic plan. We've just um, updated our strategic plan, or in fact written a new five-year plan. You've got the information on it and the associated timeline for uh, working with those goals and indicators. So there's another kind of goal. Um, with respect to high school accreditation, there are goals that are related to our accreditation process. So I think we need to be clearer when we talk about goals and making sure whether we're talking about strategic plan goals, school improvement goals, educator evaluation goals, departmental or, uh, or uh, special program goals. There are lots and lots of those uh, to, to look at. So the five goals here, just because I know this was never intended to be a PowerPoint, so it is much smaller than even the other ones were. Um, in any event, the, the five goals are special populations. Special populations would include special education, 504, ELL, um, English, English language, language learner, etc. Second goal is about negotiations. For those of you who weren't here last week, um, we have six unions, six uh, bargaining units um, in the school department. The town has a number of bargaining units and virtually all of those bargaining units on both sides of the town hall are up for negotiations this year. Tremendously demanding in terms of time, time for us here in terms of getting data together and, and a lot of time for our salary and negotiations subcommittee. Um, so there, a common goal here um, with with uh, Jamie and, <laughs> and John uh, is uh, to help out with that whole negotiation. Oh, he's back. I see you left. I'm having a feeling when you walk in a room. <laughs> uh, leadership transitions, you know, uh, this has been a concern over the years about as people transition, we want to make sure that we have sufficient time and processes in place to uh, find a suitable um, 
I don't want to use the word replacement, but successors for some of the senior positions. We know we have a couple this year. And so working with Jamie in particular, who's going to cheer up that, um, that kind of a process. Um, right now, uh, he's working on the process for uh, filling the, uh, the role that would be vacated by Chuck Cormier. And that is well underway, but we'll have other changes as well. And that's an important task to um, make sure that our process is thorough and we end up with a good uh, candidate in a very timely fashion. The social emotional needs goal, we, that was a big goal for our entire district for the past year. I think we accomplished a lot, but the work is not done. It simply is not done. There are many, many children and families that, that present with uh, some pretty uh, severe needs and we need to continue our work in that way. So it's continued, but it's different steps in looking more at a tiered approach and a number of other things. And then facilities planning is always uh, big uh, on our, our plate. Uh, we have very fortunate to have two fairly new schools in Hingham, very fortunate to have some new uh, uh, manpower and woman power actually in our facilities and our maintenance departments that got some great new um, processes in place for, for good maintenance. But we have needs. One of the needs is related uh, to Paula's um, uh, discussion about uh, adding to the wellness, the, the, the um, health curriculum and also the physical education curriculum. That was something that was voted by the school committee a couple of years ago. We have uh, other needs that have emerged to be and, and we've become more aware of because of an asset survey that was done last year by Doug um, Foley and Doug uh, had pre has presented a kind of a summary of that and the format for that as inventory to the school committee. And actually this week yeah, is we going see. to be presenting that information to other interested parties, particularly with respect to the budget, and that would be advisory committee and capital outlay folks. So that meeting is coming up on, on uh, Wednesday. Um, but we also have other kinds of needs. You know, we talked about things like windows uh, at the replacement of windows at the Plymouth River School, kind of a long-term project. Um, and we're looking at uh, embarking as soon as we can with the uh, blessing of the, of the town, um, embarking on another 10-year master plan. We do that peri periodically every 10 years or so. That involves um, having a formal enrollment projection report done and of course some of the town projects will directly impact um, the schools and, and our um, need for facilities and those would include things like the the new Avalon project that has been approved that's over at the depot and another project called the Broadstone Bear Cove project uh, which is uh, under review right now by the Zoning Board of Appeals who will act on that, we hope, in the spring. Uh, both of those are rental uh, projects, 200 or so units in each case, and, and so impact on our school enrollment. So those are important. And then town-wide, there are other, uh, other needs as well. Um, new fire station or a fire station relocated from a, uh, a, a site north station that is not conducive to adding onto. Uh, some interest in moving that possibly to the depot area, which would impact other things that we have going on there. Um, so there are a number of things that are going on, some of which we don't really control. We have to work in concert with what happens at the town hall. So there's a lot of work that we need to do uh, on that. So, so those are the, the five goal areas. I, I couldn't write 25, but I can't. Jamie has a good expression that we can do anything. We can't just do everything at the same time um, or we can do everything we can't do everything we just can't do everything yeah. so um, in any event uh, so the, the one where I made a change was the special populations um, and um, I made this change last Thursday I think because it came out in the packet on Thursday so some of the goals is uh, the action steps are still there clarifying routes for expressing concerns and be more public uh, about where that uh, those concerns can be expressed if they're beyond the level of a IEP meeting, for example, or an initial discussion somewhere. Reaching out to individual parents for personal conversations. I, I know that uh, some people are reluctant to report um, 
concerns that they have for a variety of reasons, not always the same reason, uh, but sometimes reaching out to them rather than waiting for them to come to you is a worthwhile thing to do. Um, new programs and emerging practices for certain categories of disability, uh, and those could be suggested by the um, CPAC because they are the advisory council to the school committee. Some of them can be uh, uh, presented by our own staff. I think we don't reach out often enough to our teachers, whether it be special ed teachers or regular ed teachers or uh, different categories, to say, how do you think we can do better? We tell them what we want them to do, and we may get some input from them, but I think we could reach out more for ideas from them. Many of them have worked in other places, or they're folks that are taking courses and coming up with some uh, thoughts about new plans and so on, so that's an important one. Creating uh, forums for, to allow people to do that on our staff are important. Doing separate budget information presentations for CPAC, because there's a lot of confusion about know how the budget really works on the town side and our side and what things we can control and what things we we can't control that's an important uh, step I think um, <coughs> trying to do all of this with a spirit of collaboration and culture of respect that was in there uh, last week and then this is a new one I added because while it was something we are doing anyway we didn't have it on I didn't have it on the list of uh, work for this year and that's the five-year look back on uh, the recommendations from the um, 2012 Walker Partnerships Independent Evalu Evaluation because this was is the five-year year and something we had planned from when we got that report to get accomplished. So that's really those two bullets, which are the second bullet and the seventh bullet, the last one, are new or newly written, and the rest of this is all the same as it was before. So because there was that question and, to, uh, and I know uh, a want for me to look more closely at this, um, we did not vote, or you did not vote at the last meeting. And, um, and this is too unique to the uh, educator evaluation process again, that we used to have superintendent goals and then school committee had goals. And now under the evaluation process, I still have goals that I have to present, but the school committee has to come to some consensus on that. That's new since educator evaluation, and that's why we need a, a vote or some show of consensus that with the change. That was the only uh, change in this particular goal number one that was uh, recommended that we look at, at from the last meeting, so my assumption is the others were all uh, within your comfort level. Anybody have any comments on the changes or uh, at the goal number one or any additional comments on two to five? Looks good. Mm -hmm. Looks good. I'm glad you added the last one too with the Walker yeah, report. Yeah, right. right. I don't know why I didn't put it in the in the first time because it's been on our plate since um, last summer we began looking at the five year follow up. It seems to fit here well. Okay, great. Do we need a motion on this? Yes. Okay. So I would make a motion that we accept the superintendent's goals as just elaborated by Dr. Gallo for 2016 and 2017 and as they are outlined in the document contained in our packets. I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. technical issue. Um, okay, 6.6. .6. To act on two motions to declare a surplus <coughs> an aging van and various furnishings and equipment that no longer have discernible value. This is John Ferris is going to take us through this legal steps of how we have to, when we're ready to dispose of items, Right. what it is that we have to process we have to follow so we have a, there's a couple of letters in the package one is to um you know as if we recently took the tour of um buildings 12 building 179 the garage depot and you know in light of the 
possibility of a new fireplace, uh, fire station being built on that property. And actually in good business practices, we should um, probably undertake to have um, a lot of the equipment, uh, all the equipment act that the contents in those buildings declared surplus if it has no value to us any longer. Back in 2012, we had done this prior to the middle school um, being renovated. We got it cleared out quite a bit. We did it. We did, did a pretty good job, but the middle school did fill building 12 up quite a bit. Um, and we've never really, we, we've eliminated, we, we got rid of a couple of vehicles back in 2012 around the garage depot. Um, and the, and then there's some other equipment that's around the depot too that we should dispose of. So I have uh, a motion here to declare um, surplus the, the general contents of those if they don't have any value to us and it's going to be equipment there's going to be old desks and furniture there's going to be fixtures there'll be some stainless steel um, and what we'll do is we'll uh, advertise we'll do a general advertisement in the Kingham Journal that basically alerts the public that we will be auctioning off equipment from time to time using usgovdeals.com and then we'll be able to place the ad in usgovdeals and um, you know, you don't get a fortune here, but um, it is one way of uh, getting rid of the um, the surplus inventory that really doesn't have any value any longer. Um, and then the the funds for that, in excess of whatever expenses it might take for us to dispose of the property, would actually go back to the general fund, back to the tax payers. General fund of the town for those. General fund of the mean. town, yes, because um, it the. And then the other motion I have in here, uh, the other request to declare surplus is we, we are now into um, a van replacement schedule for our special education vans. We did get a new van in last year which left one van surplus that has uh, 120, 45,000 miles on it. They've been well maintained. We've always well maintained our vans. Um, and that one there I probably would not offer off of Gov deals. I'd probably put an advertisement into the hang them journal and solicit bids because I think that will pull at least three thousand dollars or some significant funds for it so that's why they're sort of separated into two different motions okay great great so um, can we have a here's some questions well why don't we do the motion and then we'll do the questions during the discussion all right before the vote sure <laughs> you want to do it yeah, that's fine okay so can we which one first? Can we pick one? Suggestions for long range planning to make you these motions? Do the motion? Can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah, Ed, do you want to make the motion? Yeah. Um. I think it's in the memo. Yeah. Okay. Make a motion to declare a surplus and to authorize the director of business, John Ferris, to dispose of the, the to the highest bidder for the lowest cost disposable in accordance with the mass procurement laws of non-operating vehicles, equipment, furniture, and so on. Um, contents of building 12, building 179, the depot grounds, and the depot garage bays, uh, where such equipment has of no value to the Hingham Public Schools. Second that. Okay. Okay. Discussion. Questions. Other than the fact that it's a good idea to clean out your attic, where do 12 and 179 come into the discussion with the with the fight with the uh, with the fire station the potential for a fire station? Um, the the only possibility is if the town ended up doing a bigger project and creating a newer space for the school department so that those buildings could go revert back to the town and they could do uh, other things, you know, with those buildings, renovate them or, you know, take other actions that the town would see appropriate. And plus, too, Ed, I mean, it's not only, it, it may not have anything to do with the fire station, it's just sort of time to do it again as well. Amen. You know what I mean? Because we did peak down there and it is getting fairly loaded and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a thing if you were at your house you would take your stuff to the dump and you would remove it except for we're not we're a government and, and we can't really throw things out we need to go through a process <laughs> of declaring it surplus and then try our best to get some value for it and then dispose of it 
to at the least cost to the town. <coughs> so you know, as you can see, this process it's not an easy process. It, 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 I mean, it's not hard process, but it's it's sort of added on to the other duties that we really do. So that's where you know sometimes it may sit for a couple of years, and during those couple of years. We constantly have equipment being replaced in schools because the desks get to be 30 years old and chairs, and you have to replace those. You know, so we take the old desks and chairs and we move them into this building. <laughs> Fortunately, we have the space. So well, I, I'm not disagreeing with, uh, with Building 12. I was there before you did the last uh, uh, yeah. at Grandma at Excel, uh, and it was dramatic. Uh, which which building? Uh, the, uh, the depot garage. You're, you're referring to that white painted concrete cinder block yes. rectangular building yeah what percentage of that do we as a school uh, department uh, uh, utilize um, I know I, there's vans parked in there right yeah I think it's shared I think we probably have about 50% of 50 percent of it 50 percent yeah I mean we have most of the front section and then there's attic stock up above too which could have been from um, <coughs> school renovations from the 1990s or 2000s you know so basically, when, when we do a construction project, if there was materials left over, we'd take those materials and we'd keep them just in case we need them for, for a repair. <laughs> and, you know, nice to have if you have to have the repair, but um, as we all know, if we get too cluttered, we'll never even find, and we don't even know what we'll have. You know, so we may not find it. And sometimes, you know, in, in this day and age for productivity, I'd rather just go out and buy the new product as opposed to paying somebody you know, a few hours to look at it because it's really labor that's expensive these days, you know. But they're amazed there that um, the opera master uses to store equipment. They're amazed there that Hingham Maritime Center uses. Our own high school has a bay for the senior night decorations that, you know, they reuse from year to year with different different themes that um, that are in place. So. There is equipment and uh, storage space there for other departments, and we really need to ask them all to come and reorganize it, and streamline it, get rid of things that they also will never use. But we have a serious need for storage um, in are our district. Are you going to be able to have a, um, I don't know, a flea market garage sale similar to what we had at the middle school, where where the, where the town people could come in and? Well, he's value going, on a used he's going to advertise yeah, on a site where people can put in bids. The actual yard sale concept, years ago we did that on a couple of occasions. And I'll tell you, not only did we not make any money, but we lost money in terms of what we had to do. Because to have a, a true kind of yard sale, we would have to have somebody come, and this is what we have to have them do, move all of the stuff out. You really can't have people coming into those storage areas that are tight and possibly unsafe. Move everything out and then um, serve the 10 or 12 customers who <laughs> came uh, and spend time organizing and deciding on prices and so on and then move it all back in again. The reason it worked well at the middle school was the middle school was going to be begin to be demolished on the day after the yard sale. Yeah. And all we had to do was to move all the remaining things from the classrooms, things that weren't going to the new school or that weren't going to other buildings, we moved everything to the cafeteria, and people came there, and what wasn't uh, bought um, by 12.30 that afternoon stayed in the building and was demolished with the building. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, and, and we made a fair amount of money there because we had some bigger things and more recent uh, uh, acquisitions there but the reason it worked was there was very little overhead to running that event so John this uh, is school resources surpluses that you're making available why can't we instead of sending the money to the general fund of the town send it to the general funds of the school and use it the hawk well, it's not. It's not going <laughs> to. It certainly <laughs> will not add up to a, a significant chunk of money. That's that's the first. Thing. Hey, we still a little bit of time. When, when you look at it, so the taxpayer has already funded the purchase of that equipment once. So it's only fair that when you sell it, it goes back to the taxpayer. That's I mean, you know, and that's what, and that's what the law requires, requires yeah. too. But I mean, yeah. I think conceptually, that's what it is. The taxpayer has given. We get an appropriation every year from the taxpayer. 
we buy equipment and, and we and, and operation and services and you know so when we sell the equipment because it no longer has value we should give it back to the taxpayer so that they have it in their pocket and they can give it back to us later well, when we ask for we're actually back. not giving it to the taxpayer we're giving it back to the town i don't think right. it's making it back into my personal it's, yeah pocket. it's not getting <laughs> distributed <laughs> That's a nice idea. But it might sit there until we're ready to build as a matter of speaking so reserve fund ultimately yeah. right so. But the ta I mean, every year we get an appropriation, and that's from the taxpayers, and this will go into the funds of the town, and you know, it, okay. it will get redirected back to us one way or the other. <laughs> okay. So we have a we motion on the table that was seconded. Can I just ask who the second was? The uh, it was me, Cynthia. Okay. Um, and we've had our discussion. Um, yep, I'm going to put it to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Now, the, we have a motion on the Vehicle. van. Yep. I would recommend. That's at the very bottom. It's a s different kind of process. <coughs> That's why it's a different recommendation. We recommend that we um, declare, it declare for surplus. Declare for surplus. By 2004E250. With an appropriate VIN number, which you can take off uh, and declare a surplus. And the last, last paragraph is in the fund would revert. Mm -hmm. And the funds. And, and any funds fund. that would be generated would revert to the general fund. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Second. And Cynthia seconded it. Any discussion? No. And it probably should say and be sold to the highest bidder. Yeah. yeah. We've got it because we have it on the no. <laughs> Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Good. Thank well, you. Well, good that we have new vans for our special ed students. So we, okay. 6.7 to receive winter coaching assignments. This is just an update from an earlier one with some new, um, new names. You know, when, when, uh, when the comment was made earlier about the track team having a track meet at the, at the Reggie, I, I didn't get a chance to ask, but what, what's the status of, of the Reggie Lewis? I have not. I think, they, I think they, they fixed the they, situation. I think they were Quietly. working on fixing There was a situation where um, Roxbury, Roxbury, Roxbury Community College, College was right, trying to had kind of the authority for scheduling and the use of it. The, the facility is... But the facility is in use, and as right. Carol said, they yeah, okay. uh, fixed the situation that uh, made it a little bit clearer. Last they knew they were the working on be. some legislation to resolve that. It looks like we have some new coaches that are recent graduates. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's all. Awesome. Bingham High School. So mm -hmm. that's nice to have them back in the fold. Um, then, and these uh, young people, most of my young people. Uh, are are uh, folks who have gone through the Cory process and more recently also the fingerprinting uh, requirement. Great. Um, 6.8 to receive notification of the overnight field trip of the Hingham Middle School Adventure Club to Zor Outdoor Adventures in Charlemont, Mass from Massachusetts from June 10th to June 11th. Right. This is an overnight trip and that's why it gets to your level. Um, the the um, Adventure Club at the middle school has done some wonderful trips, very well supervised, always very well organized. So I certainly would uh, be intending to approve this unless you have some concerns that you would like to raise. Well, the point's been made before, but if you read the top of the, uh, the restriction, it talks about no field trips in May or June. Yeah, that's because we have one form that we use for overnight field trips that's district wide mm -hmm. and so it that is mainly a high school function this because of the nature of this trip as well so that we it's can. overnight and it's an outdoor field trip it's not something that could be accomplished um, well it's on the weekend not during the, the isn't, mm -hmm. isn't and the, it, yeah and is is on the weekend the intention yeah. is for no field yeah. trips the main June is to yeah. Try to keep kids in school during the time that testing is going right. on, and you know, finishing up of courses and right. all edit that. the form. That's all. Well, someone who's commented on these forms in the past, <laughs> numerous yeah. occasions. This is yeah. terrific. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's clean, it's legible, yeah. it makes sense, all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. It's by blessing. I, I, I thought Ed would say something. I, I did feel that it was a little thin on the <laughs> explanation of what they were doing. Um, I realize it's a weekend, more yeah. fun I think, thing, but... Right, uh, and they, it, they could have pointed out it, it was It would be weekend. nice that they add a little bit more... Yeah. I think they assume they've been around for so long and they yeah, do right. three or four of these a year, yeah. but I can ask that it be more complete because many of you are new and aren't as familiar with the kinds of things they do or what the reason for it is. Um, so I will pass those things along. I don't have any problem with the program. I just think we should have it thorough. Um, okay, so everybody good with mm -hmm. the trip? 6.9, to receive notification of the appointment of Kimberly Richards, a new Kids in Action teacher, and Allison Murnane, a paraeducator at the middle school, and Elizabeth Redmond, central office administrative assistant. 12 for 12. sure. When it's oh, Monday. 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 Next Monday, Great. we're going to hopefully well, no. know for sure <laughs> that, that she shows up. Is that the 12th? Yeah, Monday yeah. the 12th. Monday. Yeah. Monday the 12th yeah. Another Elizabeth joining the. That's right. We're gonna, the okay. third Elizabeth in this office. Oh. All Liz. Okay. Um, then 6.10 to receive notification of a few resignations. Colleen Howd in the counseling department, administrative assistant. And Christopher Grol Grolo, if I said that pr properly, paraeducator at Hingham High School. Sorry to see them go. Um, other items, 48 hours. Um, we can do that now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Donna mentioned item. earlier in our community outreach uh, meeting last week, right? <laughs> uh, we were discussing the putting the web, uh, our emails on the website. So thank you for getting that done. It looks great. Um, and one of the things, when I was looking at our website, I noticed that it might be an opportunity to add language to what's on the school committee page that, you know, when you're communicating, you know, our policies say that anonymous communications um, will be disregarded. So I looked at the policy. The policy actually specifically states anonymous complaints will be disregarded because it's in the complaint section. So we discussed at a subsequent policy meeting the um, opportunity or the idea of adding language into that policy in a separate area that just also addresses, in general, anonymous communications. Um, so that all came up very recently, and which is why it's under 48 hours. And I guess I don't know what to do with it. Actually, we should have had it in writing. I just remembered it off the top of my head. Okay. So at our so next meeting, our we'll next do meeting, the first meet yeah. the first reading on that um, issue of adding that one line into the. So think about that. Let's see. Yeah, just adding that one sentence um, under. Section 3.7.5 of policy. That's it's actually adding one more. I mean, changing one. one no, word. no, we, we decided not to do that. We were going to add. We were going to leave that complaints couldn't be anonymous. But then we were going to add earlier on um, that no no anonymous communications. Um, couldn't we do that all in one meeting if it's just you're just adding a phrase? The thought and, was unless unless somebody objects to doing it, obviously. But if there are no objections. I had asked that same question at the policy meeting, but was that told that we had to, the policy says we have a first reading, yeah. and so we'd okay. be changing our policy, policy without is. abiding by our policy. <laughs> <laughs> so that answers that question. Luckily, it's really short. <laughs> All right, so think about that. Yeah. Any other 48-hour issues? No. To, okay. Then um, I would like uh, to interject, because I did check. Yeah. I got several communications, apparently, in some people are not getting sound for this meeting and I spoke to the HCAM person so to people who see this later there are some Verizon customers in town that for some reason are not getting any sound for our program tonight um, and Just it's tonight. only Verizon <laughs> it's not Comcast and it's not HCAM it's a Verizon issue so apologies to anybody who watched, has to watch this later because they couldn't hear it now but that is a Verizon issue Liza um, I have a, a request. Um, obviously, I'm part of the town-wide 
town-wide field task force. It was supposed to meet, I guess, in sometime in November, it didn't happen. Um, I was wondering if there's anything you can do about to sort of like, you know, reach out to the people responsible and see if we can get this going. I'm sorry, can you just repeat, Carlos, task what task force? Yeah, That's the task force that we, um, the town-wide ta field task force. Yeah, it's one of the, um, the subcommittees. Okay, I'll, I'll find out what's going on with it. Thank you. Because um, <laughs> I, have, I haven't heard anything, so we'll follow up. Uh, other subcommittee reports, Kayleen? Policies um, meeting again on Monday. I don't, I think it's 11. I don't, did not bring my calendar with me, I apologize. Yeah. Um, and we are continuing to finish up our work on section six and we'll definitely get that minor change on section 3.7.5 how to for a first reading for the next meeting we outreach is meeting in january the third at 11 and where it's going to be a working session to sort of rejigger some stuff on the website hopefully and so with whomever that may be no. yes salary negotiations meeting tomorrow at uh, one o'clock Uh, the school committee, or I should say the long range planning subcommittee will be joined by the full school committee, a dual posted meeting uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday the 7th at 7 p.m. here, where they will, uh, Doug Foley will do a presentation on school facilities, uh, school maintenance practices, and uh, asset inventory. Have you had good response from the advisory committee and the capital outlay committee? Or do you know? I have not. I know I know previously had some interest when yeah. people said they would be attending and you know, so um We I'm didn't ask sure. for an hour's VP. Oh okay. Can we send, send the reminder maybe? Yeah. Maybe send a reminder <coughs> tomorrow. Did you not get did, did you folks get a I thought, okay. Yes. Recently? No. <laughs> yeah. Last week. Not, <laughs> last week. Did you get the agenda and the? No, no, I didn't get that. No. Yeah. Or we got an email last I week. I don't remember. Okay, all right. I don't think I yeah, got no, we'll, we'll get a reminder of. I know I got a notice of it originally. Yep. Yeah. The uh, special education subcommittee, uh, this end of the table, uh, have been very busy over the past month or so. Uh, with several meetings and, and, and obvious discussions. Uh, the next scheduled CPAC uh, meeting is <coughs> December 14th. I'm looking forward to it. The, there'll be reports from some subcommittees that have been formed. And uh, as I say, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that meeting. Uh, lastly, I self-appointed myself to attend the, uh, the fire station relocation committee I sent you all a PowerPoint. I zipped down there tonight. They had a concurrent meeting with us tonight for half an hour. Probably will be a PowerPoint, and I'll just figure out a way to get it and get it to you. Uh, yeah, interesting, interesting group just to see what, what they're about. Obviously, it has, that location has, has implications for us if it, if it proceeds. Um, and I wanted to update all of you on the Plymouth River Principal Search Committee. Um, Kay and Ed will represent the school committee, and I had informed Jamie of that, and I had um, communicated with them about that as well. They both volunteered, so thank you for volunteering. Um, that will be a good winter project. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Motion, motion to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion here. Second. Second. <laughs> All those, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Well done.